The king is dead. Alexander Alekine, the fourth world chess champion, is found dead in his hotel room in Estoril, Portugal. The chess crown being vacant, FIDE, the International Chess Federation, steps in. In 1948, FIDE starts a special tournament to decide who will be the next world chess champion. That champion will find out that it's hard to get to the top, but harder to stay there. After World War II, FIDE was left to pick up the pieces of the World Chess Championship and its organization. Many of FIDE's member countries, not paying their membership dues, exacerbated the situation. However, FIDE managed to rebuild and in 1946 had one of many congresses to find a solution to the vacant crown. A few proposals were submitted in regards as to who would be world champion. Two of which were that since Alexander Alekhine decided to play Mikhail Botvinnik, that he should get the title. The other was that the last remaining world champion alive, Max Uva, should win. A story regarding this is that before the Soviet delegation joined to decide the World Chess Championship, that Max Uva was awarded the crown. However, the Soviets arrived the next day and decided upon a solution to the title. So Uva was champion for one day in 1947. A solution was reached by the FIDE members to host a tournament of the top candidate players. The candidate players were Max Uva, Mikhail Botvinnik, Paul Karas, Samuel Reshevsky, and Vasily Smyslov. They also laid out the groundwork for the future challengers to the World Chess Championship. In this three-year cycle, countries affiliated with FIDE would send players to zonal tournaments, and the winners of those would move to the interzonal tournaments. The winners of those would move on to the candidates tournament, the winner of which would challenge for the World Chess Championship. So the scene was set for the 1948 World Chess Championship. The outbreak of World War II prevented Mikhail Botvinnik from playing for the World Championship against Alexander Alekhine in 1938. Born in 1911, Botvinnik was a Soviet chess champion, electrical engineer, and computer scientist. In 1941, Nazi Germany invaded the Soviet Union. His wife, a ballerina, told him that her work colleagues were being evacuated to Perm. The family found an apartment there, and Botvinnik found a job at an electrical supply organization at the lowest pay rate. In his spare time, he wrote a book in which he annotated all of the games of the absolute championships of the USSR to keep Sharpher's match against Alekhine. In 1944 and 45, Bafanik won the Soviet Chess Championship, which led to open talks with England's Chess Federation to host the World Championship match. However, Alekhine's death in 1946 would end that. The Soviet proposal to FIDE in the 1948 World Chess Championship was authored by Botvinnik, who strongly influenced the outcome of all future World Chess Championship competitions. After Alekhine's death, the new world champion was decided in the candidate tournament played in Moscow in 1948. One of the most important games of, of this tournament was played between uh, Vasily Smyslov and Mikhail Bogdini. Uh, in this game, uh, Smyslov played with E4, uh, this opening uh, suggests that White is in aggressive mode, looking for the point. And uh, Bogbini also plays c5, uh, looking for an unbalanced gain, accepting the challenge. Uh, instead, play something symmetrical. So, knight f3, knight c6, open system. And here, Black selects the move knight f6 that this leads to the uh, classical Sicilian defense. Uh, still, Black has some chance to transpose, to select other. other Alternative, after knight c3, d6, classical Sicilian defense, here Vlad can go for the, the Lican as well, okay? Uh, and, and here in some case, probably g6 may be considered, but Black have to be careful with the capture and the pawn advance to e5. So, well, d6, classical Sicilian, now bishop g5. This is known as the Richard Rouser variation. The main idea of the move is uh, try to create a structural damage, trading the bishop for the for the knight, and also uh, enabling uh, 
this diagonal for the queen looking for opposite castle situation. So e6 is a standard re uh, reply in order to be able to recapture with the queen, preventing the damage in the structure. And here we are going to see the first su surprise of the game, bishop e2. This is a side, a side line, you know, a very modest variant that, objectively speaking, don't lead to a sharp game. Uh, because if, if white wants to play uh, in, in the aggressive style, he should continue with queen d2, looking for the long castle. And the, the, the main theory of this variant is a6. To cover b5 square to prevent the pressure in the future backward pawn. Um, after the long castle, bishop d7, bishop takes, pawn takes. Um, basically, black play with the with the bishop pair, but with a more restricted pawn structure. One of the main plans in this kind of positions is play f4, f5, trying to provoke the pawn advance to be able to use the outputs on d5. For sure, black will not push the pawn because it's very important to keep the control of these two squares. To prevent the creation of the outputs and d5 and f5. So let's go back. Bishop e2, bishop e7, short castle, short castle. Okay, now uh, y is trying to put some pressure here. Uh, really, this move in a first glance looks like a silly move because after a6, it uh, seems to be like y have to retrieve the knight, but here uh, we are going to see the idea. Bishop takes on f6, creating the damage in the structure because if black captured with the bishop, the pawn on d6 falls. So, uh, but meaning recapture with the pawn to kick the defense on the backward pawn. But here, the capture with the bishop will be a very interesting alternative. And after knight takes, queen c7, takes, takes, and black have a good uh, dynamic compensation for the pawn sacrifice because we have a opposite color bishop situation with queens on the board and the expansion on the queens is incoming with some pressure in the long diagonal. Also, the, the white last score bishop potentially can be blocked by the central power and uh, black have a lot of uh, dynamics of, on the position. But uh, those kind of variants are very complex uh, to select because uh, if you don't justify the pawn of this advantage, eventually white can consolidate. But will be a very interesting alternative. So in the game of B, Nick took with the pawn, opening the G file, um, and he's going to try to create an attack on the king side. So knight e4, king to the corner. Okay, king to the corner as well, anticipating the location of the rook on ga. And here, f4. This is uh, one of the thematic plans, is push the pawn to f5 to try to provoke the advance in order to get the output for the knight. So bishop b7, bishop f3, rook to the open file, and after the capture, black recapture with the b pawn in order to have the pawn to square away, also to reinforce uh, the control on the d5 square to prevent the creation of the outputs there. So, knight e2, okay, as usual, white start a knight maneuver uh, to improve the location of the knight that was being controlled by the pawn on c6. And here, black push to d5, claiming some central control and also placing the pawns in the same color of the enemy vision. So, f5, uh, white is trying to undermine a black pawn structure. Uh, queen c7, keeping the tension. And here, uh, we have again c4. Uh, uh, again, the same idea. I mean, try to uh, remove those black central pawns. Th this way to play looks a bit ugly because why seems to be like why is play placing all the pawns in the same color of the bishop. But and also it's a bit contradictory because uh, why is trying to open the position without the bishop pair. And uh, Bogbinik uh, take advantage of this trading pawns, opening new lines so without being worried about the the temporal damage in the stroke. Uh, due to the separation of the island of pawns. So now c5, queen takes, and uh, bishop d6, uh, creating a battery over the pawn on h2. d3, bishop b5, queen c2, and pawn takes. So with the bishop pair, a roll of thumb is just three pounds to enable new diagonals. This is a bit controversial because also when white recapture, white is removing the central pawn to activate his bishop as well, but now there is a lot of tactical things uh, in relation with this diagonal. So, rook to the open file. And now black finally takes the invasion square with some threats like rook takes on f3, followed by bishop c6, uh, removing the controller of the last squares. So, in this position, Smyslov uh, removed the target. And now, after queen e7, uh, black continue increasing the pressure on, on the knight. So, uh, knight g1, bishop d3. And c4. With this pawn advance, 
Black create this strong output that control a lot of sports in enemy territory. Really, this bishop on d3 is very annoying. And, and, and a natural reaction in this kind of position is try to get rid of the output. Uh, in this case, probably the unique way to do that uh, for white would be trying to undermine the base of the output. But we are going to see uh, in the future that really this is going to be the final blunder of the game. Okay, rook f3, looking for some trades and black rain force. Rook d1. Okay, and now bishop c5, setting a trap, and white falls in that after b3. Uh, Smyslov basically overlooked that when black gets the invitation score in the first round, is creating a deadly pin here uh, because black can capture on g1, not with the rook, with the bishop for sure. Okay, and after this, basically, it's an extra piece, so start the technical phase of the game. Takes, takes, bishop f1. Uh, black just simplify and uh, we group the pieces just to consolidate. Now we have a pin uh, in the diagonal, uh, winning the change. Okay, so bishop d4, tricky move. Queen e3, taking advantage of the pin. Takes, takes. Okay, and, and this is, yeah, kind of eternal pin. So bishop g2, bishop takes, takes, invasion square, and uh, the pounds are going to fall, and this is a pass pound that is going to promote. Um, yeah, after king g2, uh, why simple reason? The king is dead. Long live the king. Mikhail Bobinik, having ended the interregnum from the death of Alexander Alakine, has been crowned the sixth world chess champion. Proving he was not a paper champion, Bobinik defended his title in 1951 against David Bronstein. Yet the challengers remain undaunted, proving the old adage true, champions beware. Getting to the top is not easy, staying there is more so. Vasily Smyslov, born in 1921, was a professional chess player and opera singer. He learned the game at age six from his father, who was a student of Mikhail Chigorin. Studying his father's chess books, Smyslov entered competition at age 14. At the age of 20, he cemented his status as a world-class chess player and a contender to the crown during World War II. After the war, he began slowly competing in tournaments and secured himself as one of the world's top players. After Alakine's death in 1948, Smyslov competed in the World Chess Championship Tournament where he lost to Bopinik. He was allowed to compete in the 1950 Budapest Canada's Tournament, not having to compete in the zonal and interzonal tournaments as per the new FIDE rules. He placed third behind Bronstein and Boleslavsky, who tied for first. He had to wait the challenge for the crown. Having been third, he was allowed to compete in the following candidates tournament and was awarded the title of Grand Master. In the 1953 tournament in Zurich, Smyslov won the chance to challenge Bobinik. However, the match ended in a dead draw, thereby allowing Bobinik to retain the championship. After winning the candidates tournament in Amsterdam in 1956, he would get another shot at Bobinik. During the reigning of Mikhail Bogbinit, uh, Vasily Smyslov uh, won the right uh, to play against Bogbinit for the world title in uh, 1957 in Moscow again. Uh, um, one of the most important games to, to decide the result of this match uh, was played uh, with Vasily Smyslov uh, using the, uh, the black pieces. Okay? Um, uh, as is characteristic of Bogbinic game, Bogbinic uh, lies to select kind of systems like red the English Kings Indian attack. In these games, we are going to see a Kings Indian attack set. So, knight of three, knight of six, g3, g6. So far, we have a symmetrical Indian structure. So, c4. Now, okay, this is a tricky game transposed into a kind of English setup. And now, here, Black have a lot of options can continue with the skin of the Kings Indian defense with d6, but uh, the selection of Smyslov was c6. Basically, here we have a kind of hybrid system because we have the Indian setup, but with a slow formation. With the pawn on c6, Blacks prepare d5 to 5 for the center and opening the diagonal for the last square vision. Uh, so this is known as the Indian defense with a slow formation. A very solid system, by the way. So, well... Uh, bishop g2, bishop g7, d4 short castle, knight c3, and d4. We have the slab set up okay, with the with the fianchetto on the king. So, uh, in this position, basically, black threat is just 
capture the pawn and protect the pawn in a greedy mode, even at the cost of lose the central control. Uh, usually, why have to do something about that? Defending the pawn with move like b3 or queen b3, or just trading pawns on d5, that is what, uh, what uh, Bogdinic did in this one. So, he takes d5, he takes d5, also, this is the main line of this position, and now knight e5. Taking the outputs and opening the diagonal for the bishop in the fianchetto. And now here, uh, Smith Love play uh, this move, this. Uh, this is a very uh, interesting move. Uh, looks like, okay, uh, Black is looking for this alternative way to develop the bishop, to control this diagonal, or to support the central pawn from behind to try to create the outputs on e4. That really this was the plan selected by Black. Uh, a downside of okay of, of, of the pawn here is that of this pawn advance is that now black have to be uh, very careful with the with the with the control of the c6 square. Another alternative variant here that can be interesting and really this is a a more classical way to fight against the outputs uh, will be with this uh, with this auction knight c6 and after the capture uh, after the capture seems to be like why create a backward pawn. That is exposed in the in a semi open in a semi open file, uh, but here after short castle black have this very nice central reaction with e5 and after pawn takes knight g4, black is ready to restore the material balance and in case of f4 queen b6 check, uh, getting uh, some interesting squares on e3 and f2. So basically here white is forced to play e3 and white can restore the material balance capturing the pawn on e3. Uh, and also winning the bishop pair. The, the, the position will be very complex because black will have the bishop pair, but three eyes of pounds. So, well, let's go back to the main line. Okay, so b6, bishop g5, uh, bishop b7. So now the bishop is supporting the central pound, and black is basically ready to take the output on e4 to give to y a bit of his, of his own medicine because y took the output on e5. So in order to prevent the creation of the output on e4, y trade the bishop for the knight first, uh, even at the cost of losing the bishop pair, but thanks to that, black managed to create a kind of unbalance uh, between the minor pieces, and, and this was the motive used by by Smyslov uh, to play this game until the end. So, castle e6, they force in the central pawn, f4, and bishop g7. With this move, black basically enabled the f6 square for the pawn to to force white to leave the control of the output. Rook c1, f6. Okay, knight f3, knight c6. Here e3 and queen d7. With this move, move number 15, black finally managed to complete the opening phase, connecting the rooks. White did the same. Queen e2, connecting the rooks as well. And now we have knight a5. This move is looking for the output uh, on c4. Uh, white play h4, looking for this rook to pawn on the king side. And after, okay, uh, black took the output. It uh, bishop h3, uh, creating this x-ray in the h3 ca diagonal. Now, knight e6, uh, this maneuver was pretty good because as Vlad couldn't do knight e4 with the knight on f6, he did all this long maneuver to try to renew uh, the possibility to take the output on e4. Also, the pawn on f6 is doing an excellent job controlling the knight on f3. So, well, in h2, this is a kind of useful waiting move. A5 to support this square with some ideas uh, of skewers in the diagonal. Y remove the target and now B5. Uh, with this move, uh, basically, uh, what Black is doing is just uh, winning some space uh, on the queens. So, knight E1, B4, knight F2. Okay, slow maneuvers, uh, typical of. Binic's gains. Also, he's looking for the outputs on c5, probably. Bishop a6, winning a tempo. Queen d1, rook to the open file. Black start to focus the game on the queen side, have more space in that sector of the board. And after all those trade of pieces, really the trade of pieces is going to highlight the difference between the minor pieces because black have a, a bishop that potentially can be very good because will not be being blocked by the central pawn. So. A lot of simplifications. Black take the invasion square. And now all those pieces disappear, uh, getting this end game where black have more space and bishop versus knight. Uh, so really, 
there is still a lot of rupture points available in the center. So potentially the bishop can be activated. Knight c4. Okay, attacking. This is a fork. Okay, why defend? This is a fork to defend the two pounds as well. And now centralization of the king. Why remove the outputs? Okay, this this move is thematic to fix the flank. Okay, and knight e4. And now here we have a controversial move. G4. Okay, h4 pound is going to be vulnerable. Okay, so well, f5 in h3. Bishop f6 to square away of the knight. So in this position, y is ready to trade the bishop for the knight in case the knight goes to g5. Now y play knight e1, but here in case of knight g5, Vlad can trade the bishop and play knight c3, taking the outputs on c3, putting pressure on the base of the, of the pound chain on the queen side. The knight is untouchable because in case of the capture, the trade of the minor pieces, the pound is going to promote easy. Okay, so well, knight e1, g7. And now all black's idea is just improve the king to capture the vulnerable pawn. Knight e3, knight c3, the knight cannot be captured. Well, in this case, okay, he took the knight, but now with this pass pawn, uh, black is going to have a permanent pressure there. So basically, this knight is going to be bind to the defense of the promotion as well. So here, knight e1, king h5, knight c2, why is doing just waiting move. And finally, the pawn. Here with the king, because Black wants to keep some options to protect the to protect the, the pawn. Also, this pawn is using as a decoy because if the king comes here, try to capture the pawn at the same time, this king can improve to put pressure in this space. So, one, five, with the bishop, we have to open the position. Okay, more waiting move. Black is slowly continuing in the location of the king. Yeah. And here, black is just do the check, controlling this diagonal to prevent king f2 to be able to penetrate with the king using the first rank. This is, you know, very, very patient, amazing technique. Two, lateral position, bishop to e7, or waiting for, waiting for, yeah, now with bishop d4, basically, black is putting pressure on d4, and if white move the knight again, f4 is incoming. Capturing on D4. For that reason, why kick the knight on C2 and play A3? Now, bishop D7, putting pressure on A3. The knight is bind to the defense of the pawn. B4, A4. Fixing, uh, fixing the flan in case of uh, the pawn advance. Eventually, this pawn will be fixed and the bishop is going to put pressure there and why is going to be in uh, For example, here, in case of a move like B5, Okay, Vlad can control the pawn um, with bishop d8, uh, controlling this square and being ready to support the, the pawn here. Uh, also, the king can come back to, to, to capture this pawn. So he did 91, bishop d5, white did more waiting move. Also, bishop here, the same idea, like he's looking for f4. And after this, finally, Vlad uh, improved the king more. So knight a1, in case of the capture on c3, king e2, for example. Let's see b5, bishop d8, king b4, king d2. Attacking the knight, removing the defender, and using this pass pawn to promote. Very complex thing. Waiting move, sook swan, stopping the pass pawn. Knight b4, bishop b6. Okay, this is almost a sook swan situation. Knight c2, bishop a5, knight b4, and now king e1. The idea is continue with king d1 and eventually just capture and push the pawn and promote it. So, with, 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 uh, with, with winning this game, uh, finally Smith Love managed to become in the new world champion in 1957. And easy is the head that wears a crown. Vasily Smyslov has just achieved his life's goal to reach the heights of chess and win its crown by defeating Mikhail Bopinik, Fide's first champion. Smyslov will be put to the test. To confront the old adage, you're not a real champion until you've defended your title successfully. Moscow, 1957. Bopinik had just lost convincingly to Smyslov, his longtime adversary. His long-held crown was slipping through his fingers.
The contest between these two men have, as of late, been going the way of Smyslov. In 1954, a 12-12 tie resulted in Botvinnik retaining the title. In 1957, however, 12.5 to 9.5, with Smyslov winning convincingly. Botvinnik, however, would not renounce his crown so easily. The pre-World War II custom of a mandatory rematch was more of a privilege than a rule with the champions of old. Lasker and Alekhine used the rule with the consent of the victor. For Capablanca, not having negotiated this before his match with Alekhine, he had to pursue Alekhine for a rematch that never happened. In 1956, Fide allowed this rule to be formed, so Smyslov had one year to prepare before his mandatory rematch. After winning the title, Smyslov suffered the loss of his stepson, a chess player in his own right, and as a result of political maneuvering from Botvinnik, he had to face his opponent. Botvinnik, on his end, was being asked to let go of his claim to a rematch, citing, quote, to prevent him from additional embarrassment. Botvinnik, the old man of chess, aged 46, was 10 years older than his rival. However, even with age and life's events, and poor health from the champion, they met on March 2nd, 1958. In 1958, uh, Mikhail Bogbinit had the right to play a rematch uh, against Vasily Smyslov that uh, defeated him in, in the past match. Uh, according to the rules of that moment, he had the right to, to, to play a game for, for, for the world title. Um, in this game, uh, that we are going to see Mikhail Bogbinit using the white pieces, uh, uh, manage uh, to, to come with uh, an interesting game. So let's start, c4. Usually, what we need uh, play systems, English, uh, ready, things in an attack, so we, we have another schematic game. Um, in this case, uh, Smyslov used uh, a pretty standard setup uh, with c6. With c6 and d5, Black basically is going to use a slow scheme uh, in, in, in the previous match, he used uh, the G6 move that is known as the Indian setup with the Slav formation. But in this game, we are going to see the Slav formation without the Fianchetto on the keys. And basically what Black did is create a London system formation with inverted points, followed by E6 building the pyramid. In this specific setup, this, uh, this move is pretty safe because one of the downsides of the move is that B7 can be unprotected. But as this pawn is already on b3, why cannot make use of this square to put pressure on b7? So what? Bishop b2, b6, bishop b2, maybe b7, short castle, and now a6. This is a useful move because after y cover the e4 square, usually with d3, the knight jump to h4, trying to win the bishop pair, is a thematic idea. So basically, black is just anticipating the future plan by y, but uh, being dig d3. Bishop d7, knight bd2, short castle, the standard move. Okay, now we have here a3. The idea of the move is just prepare expansion. Okay, with d4, probably to enable this score for the knight. So we have a5, prophylactic move. Why wants to do the expansion with b4 with a5 black, uh, just prevent that. Now queen c2. Okay, this move in a first glance looks risky because the queen is in the far end of the bishop. But really is a unique square available for the queen to be able to connect the rooks at the moment. And also in case of the capture, why have a lot of alternative ways to recapture without open the, the diagonal. So looks ugly, but it's perfect playable. So bishop h7 and now bishop c bishop c3, renewing the idea of, of the expansion on the queen. So now black try to take the initiative. Uh, b5 takes takes. And here now we have b4. Uh, the idea of b4 is enable the b3 uh, square for the knight. So we have queen c7. Okay. Also, quite logical will be pound takes, pound takes, and knight b6 looking for the output zone on a4. Something similar happens in the game, but black incorporate this move that really is pretty logical, pinning the bishop, connecting the rooks. Now black is capturing this, okay, so why have to do something about that? We be to reinforcing the, the b4 pound and avoiding the pin. Now we have knight b6. Black is ready to take the output on a4 with a fork. So uh, bishop e5, intermediate move. Removing the target as well. Queen d7, knight b3. 
White is going to take his own output as well. So eight of pounds, trade of rooks, some simplifications here, and black took the output. Queen d2, rook to the open file, rook to the open file. So until this position, the game has been very, very slow, and at the moment is uh, absolutely balanced. The valuation of this position is completely balanced. But uh, Bogbini really enjoy a lot these kind of games, long games with, with, with some complex in-game position. So one of the differences in, in, in this position is that the d4 square is still available because why don't have the pawn on d4? So this square can be used by a knight, and we are going to see how Bogbini did that in the game. So rook takes. Now they capture with the knight because the queen have to kick the pawn on d4 defended. So knight a. Okay, this is a nine maneuver. So knight e4, okay, placing the knight in front of the most advanced pawn of the opponent used to be something good to do. King f8 and bishop h3. So in this position, a uh, common idea here is try to play f5 and e5 to attack the bishop and attack the knight. But the trouble with f6, sorry, with f6 is that in case of f6, bishop h3 is very annoying creating the intersection point and black won't be able to capture the bishop to the bishop takes only six check losing the queen. So for that reason, uh, in this position, Smyslov played the prophylactic move king to f8, preparing f6 in good condition because in that way the capture on e6 will not be with check. So uh, now bishop h3, prophylactic move again, preventing f6 due to the capture. Bishop g8, reinforcing e6. And now knight db3, making room for the bishop to be able to uh, regroup the bishop after f6 as far as possible to square away of the knight. Now we have here queen a7 and d4. This move is controversial because uh, white is placing this central pawn, blocking the bishop in the long diagonal, but at the same time, white is trusting in the creation of the output on c5. Because once Y create the outputs on C5, that output will be so annoying that basically black is going to be more or less forced to capture the knight. And after the capture of the knight, somehow Y can simply recapture with the D pound opening the diagonal for, for, the, for the sniper uh, on A1. Knight so, D6. Okay, Queen A2. Uh, anticipating the knight C4 move. And here finally knight C5. So, we have this capture, black cannot capture with the knight due to the pin. And finally, white recapture with the D pawn, removing the central pawn and activating the, the bishop. Again, we have a case of uh, bishop pair advantage, uh, but uh, this is a long term advantage that uh, demands uh, a lot of patience and, and also very good techniques. E5, quite logical move, placing the pawns in the same court of the enemy bishop. And D4, as Mislov continue with, the, with a good strategy. And here, queen f5. With this move, white is looking for some invasion squares. And right now, black did uh, this move, queen c7, to try to cover the invasion squares. Uh, now, with this move, uh, there is a possibility to try to look for invasion squares using the e4 square, but fears, uh, but we need to play knight d3 to improve the, the minor pieces that was uh, in the edge of the board. And finally, after some repetitions, okay, now queen e4, looking for the invasion square in the background. Okay, so bishop f7, check, bishop e8, and now bishop d2. So why took the initiative? Here there is a very interesting variant. Okay. Here takes, takes, and knight f4, looking for this fork, and with a very strong pressure in the position, but this uh, piece of sacrifice no, is too clear, really. Very, very risky. Okay, so really, the move that he that he did is more logical. Also, there is a strong pass pound here that black have to take into account. In e7, and now f4. This move is very important. The, the player that have the bishop pair should open the position, it, 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 just trading pounds. Okay, now uh, it's Miss Love took this output on e3, but really, and this move actually is a blunder because taking the output, he's losing. Uh, the, the support in the central pound and now after takes, takes, queen e4, this pawn uh, basically is going to fall because it's thin and in case of knight c4, uh, y can just uh, capture the sorry, capture the pawn on d4 due to the pin. Okay. So, well, 
in this position, really, the correct outputs to be taken by black will be a really nice entry. Okay, threatening the pawn and also blocking the diagonal to avoid the creation of the intersection points here in the center. So after knight e3, uh, white trade pawns opening the position and with queen e4 uh, start to put some pressure in the base. So there is a lot of uh, coordination for the, for the minor pieces. So after knight takes g2, knight takes e5, strong intermediate. Uh, now white is preparing some uh, discover checks. Uh, for example, let's say here, uh, Smithlov decides to resign. Sample variant here, let's say something like 93, trying to regroup the knight, but after 93, bishop takes e4, is uh, uh, absolutely crushing because this knight really don't have any square available. It's trapped. Right? The unique square available at the moment is c4, but why can't just capture with check, okay? Uh, having two pounds of advantage and, and uh, a strong. Uh, 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 domination. One chance to win. The winner and loser share the same event, but not the same memory. For Bopinik, he reclaimed his throne by exercising his rematch clause. New challengers awaited a young player from Riga. Both will soon learn that dreams and nightmares vanish. Mikhail Tal, the winner of the 1959 Candidates Tournament in Yugoslavia, was at this point the youngest challenger to the World Chess Championship. From an early age, his gifts shine bright, and he learned to read at three, did advanced arithmetic in his head at five, and learned to speak five languages fluently. However, his mental gifts came with a downside of health problems. He had to endure constant surgeries for his illnesses that left him too weak to pursue physical sports and hobbies. Despite all of this, he managed to play piano and begin university at age 15. Tal's chess journey started when he lost his first match to his cousin. This made him interested in learning how to beat him, so when the opportunity arose, Tal, while going to sign up for drama lessons, came across a chess group. In 1957, Tal won the USSR Championship and was at that time the youngest player to do so. Fide awarded him the title of Grand Master even though he did not possess the previous titles as usually required. By 1958, Tal was recognized as the strongest player in the world, so undeniable to Bobanik, the current champion, that he had to play him. Bobanik knew that, quote, at the time, everyone was fed up with me. How long could one person continue to occupy the throne? Bobanik was not of the same mind. He waged psychological warfare before the match by imposing outlandish terms to all the challengers. However, Tal accepted all, knowing that all he needed was to get him on the board. So on March 15th, at the Pushkin Theater, the magician went against the strategist. In 1960, uh, Mikhail Bogvinit had to play a match for the world title, but uh, this time against Mikhail Tal. He was defending his title that he won uh, against Vasily Smyslov. Um, uh, in this game, Mikhail Tal decides to play with black pieces, a very sharp variant, the king's Indian defense uh, that usually leads to very uh, sharp positions. Let's see the game. Uh, but Binic, as usual, open with c4, knight f6, knight f3, g6, g3, bishop d7, bishop g2, and now short castle. Uh, in, here it's important to remember that in some of the match that Bogbinik played against uh, Vasily Smyslov, Smyslov uh, used the the Indian defense set up both uh, with a slow formation, c6 and, um, and d5. But in this case, uh, Mikhail Tal decides to play the classical set up with d6. Uh, that this is uh, known as the main line of the King's Indian defense. So knight c3, knight bd7, uh, preparing the central pawn advance with e5, or in some case, uh, also with c5, so short castle e5, e4. And now c6. In this moment, black is keeping the tension and the possibility to trade pounds to open the diagonal for uh, for the bishop. In other hand, the capture of the pawn is going to create a backward pawn on d6. So all is about uh, some kind of positional compensations. Uh, with this variant that uh, Tal is playing, he is playing this. He's placing this pawn to square away of the knight. 
Controlling the night jumps and keeping the tension between uh, the pawns in the center of the board, d4 and e5. So if white decides to advance, basically uh, some squares start to be available for the knight because the pawn on d4 is controlling the knight on d7. So it will be really a different approach in, in, instead of the capture on d4. Now h3. This is a move that basically prepares bishop e3 and anticipate the knight jump to g4, chasing the bishop with the knight. And now he plays queen b6. Uh, those both are quite logical. But being it play h3, preferring bishop e3 uh, to prevent the knight g4. And now, as a response, uh, Mikhail Tal decides to play queen b6 to put pressure on the pawn on b2. Because with the pressure on the pawn on b2, this bishop have to be uh, bind to the defense of the pawn. So, well, finally, Bukbinik decides to close the center to start a positional battle. And okay, after the trade of pounds, uh, Mikhail Tal opened the C file and start to try to uh, realize on operations throws this file. This position is uh, very interesting and variable because the original pound chain is aiming to the king side for black and for white uh, to the queen side. So, Looking at the pawn structure, it's quite natural that white should try to play on the queen side and black on the king side. But in this game, we are going to see that really Mikhail Tal playing both flanks. For that reason, it's a very instructive and interesting game. Now, knight c5, taking this noise an output jet, but it's a kind of output. Noise in enemy territory, but then the minor pieces here is being supported by, by the pawn from behind and cannot be removed because the queen is taking care of the b4 square. So now, 91, uh, White is preparing to challenge the knight. So bishop d7, finally connecting the rooks. And okay, White have more space, but black, let's say, have a better development of the minor pieces. So knight d3, takes takes, rook fc, and rook to the open file. And here, okay, White is, in, is still interested in the complete the development, but the pawn is hanging. So for that reason, rook b1. Protecting the pawn, and finally the bishop is ready to go out to connect the rooks. Knight h5, black star the, the game on the king side, uh, bishop e3, and now here queen b4. Here it's important to mention that in case of in case of a move like b4 uh, to prepare bishop e3, and now queen d4 may be very annoying because uh, basically the idea is straight queens and remove the defender of the knight that is exposed in the open file. Also, this move is very risky because he's leaving the minor pieces without the support of the pound from behind. Usually when a piece is without support, without the support of the pound, that can be considered as a kind of tactical motive, even uh, without the pieces completely hanging, because in this case, it's still being defended by the queen, but remember the queen, uh, no, is the best defender. So we should eat queen b4, queen e2, and now rook c4. Okay, uh, Mikhail Tal take the invasion as well and is preparing double rooks in the in the unique open file. So rook f c1, rook a c8, king h2, and finally here f5. Uh, so black start the initiative on the king's takes to enable the e4 square. In normal conditions, really, it's a good idea capture with the pawn to kick this uh, central control. And this will be a kind of Hanging pounds, not not really hanging pounds because this is still defended by by the base on d6. But in this case, the capture with the pawn no, is possible because the knight is hanging. So Tal is forced to capture with the bishop. Okay, fighting for the initiative, but at the same time, uh, eventually the e4 square can be a good location for white. Usually, this is not the case because black have a lot of pieces controlling this uh, this square, so difficult for white block the. Uh, the e4 square with the knight. That will be really the ideal location for the knight. So rook a1, and now, well, a uh, fantastic move, typical move by Tal, knight f4, uh, creating the a chaotic situation where it's very difficult uh, uh, kick the control in this kind of situations uh, for white. Basically, the, the sacrifice of the minor pieces is more positional because the sniper, the bishop on g7 is being blocked by the central pawn. So the sacrifice of the knight will allow black recapture with the pawn, activating that score bishop in the long diagonal, and also taking the initiative and opening some lines against the king. Uh, for sure, the unique auction for white is a, is a second challenge, and 
after pound takes, the bishop is under attack. The bishop at the moment don't have squares available. Okay, so uh, he played bishop d2. Here it's important to say that uh, a better option will be a3, attacking the queen, and after queen b3, bishop takes on on, on, on a7. Uh, in this moment, the capture on a7 is also possible, but after queen a5, the bishop may be without a square. Okay. So that is a very risky variant. Well, uh, Bobinic played bishop d2, queen takes b2, uh, here, black half bishop d5, that would be an interesting move to consolidate the pawn structure and also uh, threaten in f3. Really, this will be a better version. Bishop d5, intermediate move, and after f3, queen takes on b2. But well, after the capture, okay, white player rook a b1 attacking the queen. Here seems to be like uh, the rook is hanging, but really uh, it's, it's a chain sacrifice in order to to simplify a little bit. So uh, in strong intermediate move by Mikhail Tal, f3. And with all those uh, complex variations, finally, uh, meaning make a blunder capturing the queen on, on b2. The, the strange of the pass pound after the capture with the, uh, of the queen uh, will be decisive. Here, a, a better variant will be bishop takes f3, take capture b1, rook takes queen c2, Okay, and rook c1, and um, in this variant, white managed to kick two minor pieces for the for the rook. Still, the technical phase is pretty difficult because basically white have four isle of pounds, all the pounds are isolated, and uh, really is a very difficult situation. Okay, uh, to consolidate kicks the advantage for sure. Uh, so in the game, after f3. Uh, Bogminic decides to cut to the pawn on b2. And now, after pawn takes, rook b3, bending the knight on c3 to kick the extra pieces. So now, rook d4. Basically, here, uh, black is ready to remove this defender. Bishop is uh, regrouped to the first rank. Now, bishop d5 check into g1, bishop d4. The rook is in trouble. The bishop pair and the pawns are controlling a lot of squares here. So now, uh, in case of something like rook a1, for example, uh, basically black can sacrifice the rook here and get the invasion square with check and promote a new queen. So knight takes on e2, rook takes c1, knight takes, rook takes check. Uh, in this variant, finally, Mikhail Tal managed to restore the, the material balance of the minor pieces, but the, you know, the balance is still an extra pound for black and also bishop pairs so material and positional advantage. This bishop is being blocked by the central pawn. So we can say that now start the technical phase for black. Okay, bishop d5 to square away of the knight. F4, bishop f6. Uh, white take a pawn. Black do the same. Okay, and here the, the, the bishop pair is very active because the position is completely open. Bishop c4 increasing the pressure here on the pin. Some checks. And now, uh, Tal decides to start to push the pass. King f2, bishop h4 check. Now, king d6. Black is preparing to uh, improve the location of the king, in game principle. Finally, after knight g3, Black can simplify everything to create a rook in game with an extra pawn. So, and here, after king d5, uh, Black is ready to advance the king uh, together with because the, the white king is too far and also is separate uh, from this sector of the board because the rook is controlling this space. So now, basic pawn must be pushed. Okay, and after the check, uh, um, Mikhail Tal improved the king and later promote the pawn. So, uh, Bogbinik resigned. Um, with this result, finally, Mikhail Tal uh, managed to become in the world champion, uh, really. Uh, at that moment, was the uh, youngest world champion uh, at that point. On May 10th, 1960, Tao, at 23, was the youngest world champion at that point, being awarded by FIDE's vice president the gold medal and the laurel wreath of the world chess champion. Bobinik executed his rematch clause and went to work arranging the details beneficial to him with FIDE and his president. 
At the 1960 Chess Olympiad, having had card difficulties, Tal arrived late to the meeting with FIDE's president and Bobinik, who prior to his arrival had made the agreements to the match. Additionally, Tal, suffering from his lifelong renal issues, needed to postpone the match on advice from his doctor from Latvia. However, Bobinik insisted he travel to Moscow to have a Russian doctor certify his illness. Tal relented and decided not to postpone the match. Two weeks before the match, Tal suffered a mild heart attack. Still, he continued his chain smoking 50 to 60 cigarettes a day and heavy drinking. Bobinik, who had never played Tal until the championship, changed his playing style to keep Tal from recognizing his familiar style of play. He made the game slow wars of maneuvers and end games, not the tactical battles that Tal loved. So the board was set, the old line at 49 was set to face the young champion of 24. In 1961, uh, Mikhail Bogvinit had the right to, to face uh, Mikhail Tal again for the rematch of the, of the world title. So this time, uh, Bogvinic uh, used his classical English opening. Uh, Mikhail Tal played knight of six, uh, probably tending to play the king's Indian defense as usual. But uh, uh, a surprise for this game is that he played e6, looking for queen gambit decline set of ordnings or Indian defense. So after b4, finally bishop b4. This is, the, this is known as the knees of Indian defense. The idea is create a damage in the, in the structure. Uh, to play with the knights against the bishop pair, but with a better punish trooper. So for for this variant, uh, Bogvinic played a3, challenging the bishop, and in order to be consistent, black uh, play the minor pieces to create the damage in the structure. So now b6, this is a pretty logical move to start to place the bounce on that square. Also, this bishop is being blocked by this pawn structure, and black is looking for the development using the, the long diagonal. And here, f3. Uh, this is a thematic way to play against the bishop in the future location in the long diagonal and also the pawn control the knight and prepare the central expansion with e4. So bishop a6, putting pressure on c4, e4, and now uh, d5. This is probably the first controversial move of the game because why have the bishop pair and double pawn? So after d5, basically why can three pounds opening the position, getting rid of the unique weakness, and that position should be good. I think probably Mikhail Tal decision was based in, in a kind of most win situation, or he was just taking some risks uh, to create uh, unbalance. But here, probably a, a better move in the positional point of view maybe would be d6, in order to kick the pounds in the same color of the enemy bishop without position, and trying to prefer kick the position block with c5 or d5. But well, he did d5, and after takes, 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 here a potential compensation can be that uh, the king it will be in the middle of the board and why won't be able to connect the rooks. But really, uh, Bogvinic managed to resolve this in a, in a very good style. So after pound takes, he played bishop g5. Uh, this move is very interesting. Uh, probably e5 is a move that... Uh, Looks super logical, uh, avoiding the tension, and also basically to win a tempo, attacking the knight. But on the other hand, the player that have the bishop really would like to trade pawns. So I think this option is very flexible and very clever, considering that he still have the bishop. After a6, then a4 checks, c6, and now uh, he play uh, bishop h4. So after pawn takes, rook e1. Sacrifice a pound in order to open the position, open the file, open the diagonal. So now g5, we should have two as far as possible. And now here, Tal play queen e7. Here, probably castle will, will be simpler uh, to complete the development, but at the same time, in case of castle, there is some rook to points available with h4, and maybe the king can be in a risky situation there. So queen e7, knight e2. Uh, here, uh, Bogvinic knows worried about the, the fact that uh, Tal can capture the power of f3 because later any knight jump is going to open the file, okay, and um, preventing knight e4, blocking the file, so basically why can win the queen. This pawn is untouchable, so b5, queen c2, and now queen takes on a3. Uh, at this point of the game, 
there is no return for Tal. Okay, he decides to play in a super sharp way, taking a lot of risks, and he continues in, in, in that move, uh, grabbing the part on A3. Now, all is about for white, uh, all is about uh, take advantage of the initiative and the better development. So, H4. So, white managed to find a way to hook the two rooks into the game uh, without connector, without have to connect the rooks. So, very good move. Takes stakes with the less value pieces, putting pressure on the knight. Tal reinforces the knight, and now knight g3, increasing the pressure on the pound. So, white is ready to recover one pound of the two pound sacrifice before. Uh, Lord Castle, the capture with the knight to kick the file open. And after this, uh, King F2. Finally, White managed to connect the rooks and the king is pretty safe there. Knight takes, pawn takes, and here uh, F6 really is the unique way to, to save the rook. And after rook A1, finally, uh, White managed to capture the second pawn uh, with a balance situation, at least in the, in the, in the material point of view. So rook takes on A7. Queen takes on a4, okay, black uh, wins a pound again, but after this, uh, all these trades, check, and bishop g3 increasing the pressure on the pin. So black have to move the king, now double rooks, uh, defending the rook on the corner, and after rook c8, here white can win a pieces by force after check, the king b6, and bishop takes on b8. Uh, the bishop cannot be captured due to the checkmate here. One a six, so uh, he uh, Mikhail Tal play b four, making room for the king to escape via b five, and after bishop d six, pawn b six, pawn takes, bishop c five, check. Uh, Bogbinik managed to create an output for the minor pieces, and finally with with the minor pieces saved, uh, he consolidated the position. So after king b five, rook one a four, and this real situation for a unavoidable checkmate incoming. Rook b4 is incoming, and really, black cannot do anything about that. Maybe sack the rook on d4, but losing even more material. So uh, at this moment of the game, Mikhail Tal, resi Mikhail Tal resigned, and Bobinic managed to recover the, the title of the war champ. Once again, Bobinic reclaims his crown. However, it will be short-lived. As new challengers overtake him, so ends the period of the 1948 through 1961 World Chess Championship. <laughs>